We're going to start out with uh, this scripture. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? As, as we look at this scripture, as we read it, we see there's three things that the Lord requires of us. And it's to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. And it just makes sense to do what God requires of us. It makes sense to do these three things. And I believe that it pleases God when we do what he requires of us. When we live the way he wants us to live. In the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And in the NIV, it reads, and find out what pleases the Lord. Again, it makes sense to do what God tells us to do. And we're told here to find out what pleases God, what pleases the Lord. And so this verse it begs the question, well, what is pleasing to God? And that's what I want to talk to you about today as we look at the question, what is pleasing to God? You know, we've already read the three things in uh, Micah 6, 8, you know, to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly. Those things, I'm sure they're pleasing to God when we do those things. But I want to focus on one other thing that pleases the Lord this morning. And we find this other thing, and it's probably the most important thing that pleases the Lord. And, and we are, we're going to see this in the account of the healing of blind Bartimaeus. So we're going to go through the account of this healing of Bartimaeus, who was blind. And it begins in Mark 10, verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples, and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. See, Jesus, he was passing through Jericho. He was accompanied by his disciples and a large crowd. And this crowd, that they were probably made up of, of Jews who were also on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. That's where Jesus was headed. And they came upon this blind beggar sitting by the roadside. Beggars, they often waited along roads near cities because that was where they were able to contact the most people. And Jericho, they had a lot of wealthy people. And so it was a popular location for beggars. And beggars, they were unable to make a living because they were disabled in some way. Medical help was not available for their problems, and, and people tended to ignore their obligation to care for the needy. It, it tells us in Leviticus uh, chapter 25 that God told the people at that time to, to care for those in poverty, to take care of those who couldn't care for themselves. But most of the time, they didn't. So beggars, they had little hope of escaping this degrading way of life, having to beg. Now, as we go through this account of the healing of Bartimaeus, I'm going to be sharing some insights from a book by Charles Martin. The name of the book is, What If It's True? 
A Storyteller's Journey with Jesus. Now, Charles Martin, he's not a theologian, and, and most of his books are, are fiction, but he gives some interesting insights in his book as to how things may have looked like at that time and, and what may have taken place. So he describes Bartimaeus this way. We don't know how long he's been there sitting by the roadside every day. We do know that his name, Bartimaeus, means son of Timaeus. The fact that he's known by any name at all suggests he's been around long enough for people to get sick and tired of the persistent rattling of his tin cup. He seldom bathes, smells unpleasant, his hair is matted, food particles caught in a greasy beard, clothes tattered, and the location Bartimaeus has chosen to sit begging is strategic. This is storied ground. The city of palm trees, as it's called in Deuteronomy 34, verse 3. This is the very gate in Jericho, where Joshua, or Yeshua, as he's also can be called, he was the successor to Moses, whose name means Yahweh is salvation. And Joshua marched around the city and defeated an enemy with a shout, a spoken word. And it is here that Joshua rescued the harlot Rahab, a defiled woman, and all her family because she hid the spies and believed the Lord your God. He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And it's also interesting in the book of Joshua chapter 6 that it says that this city is under a curse. So Bartimaeus, he now sits by this same gate as another Yeshua comes near. Verse 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, Charles Martin goes on to say in his book, he says, Bartimaeus is blind, not deaf. He's no doubt heard about the lepers, now clean. About the lame, now dancing. About the demons, cast out. The 5,000, fed. The paralyzed man, lowered through the roof, who walked out the front door. The lame man at the pool of Bethesda who picked up his mat. About the woman who bled. And he's heard about Lazarus and how he's been in that stone tomb four days. And when the carpenter from Nazareth called him out. He's heard the power of Jesus' words and how he speaks even with the filthy and the defiled. As Jesus approaches the noise of the crowd reaches Bartimaeus' ears. He knows they are still some way off, but he can't contain himself any longer. He stands and begins jumping up and down, waving his arms. Son of David, have mercy on me. He shouts again and again and again, so much so that the crowd tells him, Shut up. Can't you see he's busy? But that's the point. He can't see. Let's talk for just a moment about that term, son of David. It's a messianic claim. By saying it out loud, the speaker is stating for all who would listen that he believes the prophecies 
that were spoken by both Ezekiel and Isaiah about the Messiah coming from the line of David. Ezekiel said, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd. Isaiah said, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So Bartimaeus, he's heard these prophecies, and he may be thinking the same thing Isaiah thought when Isaiah also said, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. And the same thing Joel thought when he said, Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And the same thing the psalmist thought when he said, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. So Bartimaeus, he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Then we go on to verse 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise. He is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Charles Martin continues in his book describing the encounter of Bartimaeus with Jesus this way. The sound of Bartimaeus' voice reaches Jesus' ear, and he stops walking or stood still and commands that he be brought to him. The crowd quickly changes its disposition. Come on, hurry, he's calling you. Mark states that Bartimaeus threw aside his garment or cast it away. Charles Martin says, that strikes me. Talking about Bartimaeus. He's going before the Messiah, the King of glory, the God of angel armies, the very Son of God, the Son of righteousness with healing in his wings. The one who called out Lazarus when he was four days dead. And yet, Bartimaeus goes forward with no pretension. Nothing to cover his filth. Nothing to dress him up. If anything, he undresses. And this tells me a lot about the desperation in his heart. Bartimaeus, he elbows his way blindly through the crowd. People are ushering him forward. Hurry, he's calling you. He's very busy. Bartimaeus, he bounces forward like a pinball. Feet shuffling. Steps uncertain. Now, note the context here. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, to the cross, where he's going to redeem the people from the curse. And Jesus knows this. He's walking straight toward his own ex execution. And yet, for some illogical and inexplicable reason, he stops to talk with the blind, smelly beggar living under a curse. Charles Martin goes on to say that this picture shakes some stuff loose in me. It rattles my foundation. Why? Because there's a piece of my heart that needs to know that I, with all of my filth and all that should disqualify me, that I matter to the God of the universe. 
the God who made me, that I'm worth his time when he has better things to do. And all of us here this morning, we matter to God. We are worth his time when we call out to his name in whatever situation we may be facing, we matter to him. Verse 51. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you, you, what do you want me to do for you? Well, obviously Jesus already knew what Bartimaeus needed, what he wanted. And his question was, was not to gain information, but to allow Bartimaeus to specify his need. And in the process, to declare his faith that Jesus could meet that need. Charles Martin also gives his opinion as to the question Jesus asked Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And Charles puts it this way. Jesus knows Bartimaeus is blind, but Jesus is not asking for his own benefit. And he's not really asking for Bartimaeus' benefit. He's asking for the benefit of all those people milling around. The folks with their fingers pressed to their lips or their hands in their pockets. The doubters and the haters and the debaters. Jesus wants to encourage them, challenge them, wake them up. Why? Because his time is growing short. And this slumbering crowd is waiting for him to show up while the blind idiot dancing along the wall is declaring before the world that he has arrived. What do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? And Bartimaeus, the blind man, he said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. He was answering the question that Jesus already knew the answer to. Jesus already knows the answers to our requests, to our questions that we have for him. But there's something about confessing and admitting and speaking whether it's for others to hear or just for yourself to hear when Jesus asked the question what do you want me to do for you so then verse 52 says Jesus said to him go your way your faith has made you well and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Your faith has made you well. And this brings us back to that question we began with this morning. What is pleasing to God? And we find the answer in the book of Hebrews. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And here in the streets of Jericho, God is pleased by Bartimaeus. Jesus is pleased by the faith of Bartimaeus. The most important thing that pleases God is our faith because without faith, it's impossible to please him. And Charles Martin, in his, his book, he makes this comment about the statement that Jesus made, your faith has made you well. He says, faith has made you well? Which part? The jumping up and down? His screaming at the top of his lungs? His casting away his cloak? The calling on the name of the Lord? I don't know. I just know that faith does stuff. Faith cries out. Faith acts. Going back to Ephesians 5 and verse 10 that we read a little while ago and find out what pleases the Lord. Our faith 
is what pleases the Lord the most. But I also want to point out three other things that we can see in the healing of Bartimaeus that I believe are significant this morning. First of all, his identity changed. The identity of Bartimaeus before he was healed, before he regained his sight, he was a blind beggar rattling a tin cup. He seldom bathed. He smelled unpleasant. His hair was matted. His clothes were tattered. But after his healing, he became a follower of Jesus. He was no longer looked on as a depressed beggar with no future. His identity was in Christ. His identity changed physically with the restored sight. And his identity changed spiritually with the assumed acceptance of salvation because of his faith. He became a follower of Jesus. And as a follower of Jesus, your identity is more important than how you think your identity looks to others or even how you look at yourself. Because placing your faith in Christ changes everything. Your identity in Christ is important. Second thing that I believe is significant is Jesus is always passing by. Bartimaeus, he cried out to Jesus when he heard that Jesus was passing by. And Jesus heard him. When we cry out to Jesus and, and whatever kind of, of a disability we may have, whether it's physical, spiritual, or, or financial, or something else, you can be sure that he will hear you because Jesus is always passing by. He's always near. And he will ask you, what do you want me to do for you? And you can answer him with your request. And he will answer you in some way. You know, it's not always the way you think. It may not be as quick as you would like. But Jesus is going to do something because of your faith. Because faith does stuff. The third thing that I believe is significant this morning is Scripture records one final interesting occurrence on that street near Jericho. In the account of uh, the healing of Bartimaeus, in Luke chapter 18, Luke records the same miracle, but he doesn't mention the name Bartimaeus. But in Luke 18, 43, it says, And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God, and all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And Charles Martin describes it this way, without being told, without being prompted, when Bartimaeus declared for all the naysayers, I can see the third significant thing happened. Everyone spontaneously gave praise to God. Collectively, all those doubters in the crowd, all those people, with their fingers pressed to their lips, the same people who were shushing Bartimaeus and telling him to shut up. Now they were jumping up and down, screaming at the top of their lungs, Son of David, Son of David. Bartimaeus believed Jesus was the Messiah. By faith, he asked Jesus to restore his sight. The result was giving glory to God. And that's what happens when the blind see. Belief is the decision. Faith, the action. Praise, the effect. So as we close here this morning, can we believe that Jesus is always near, that he's always passing by? Can we declare our faith in what he can do by speaking his name and then 
give him the glory and the praise for whatever the result is, even if it's not what we think it should be or we would like for it to be. Let's stand as we just sort of ponder this thing that uh, pleases God more than anything else. As his word says, without faith it's impossible to please him. Faith does stuff. And if you need something done this morning or this week, or in some situation, you know, you can just just cry out like Bartimaeus did. Just let Jesus know what he already knows. But he wants you to, uh, to tell him, to ask him, to show him that you have faith in him and you trust him for an answer. So God, we thank you for all the times that you have answered and that you have shown yourself mighty, that you are always passing by, ready to do s stuff in our lives, in whatever situation we may be facing, whatever situation anybody here may be facing or a family member may be facing. God, we pray for those. And God, we just listen for your question. What do you want me to do for you? And God, we just ask you to meet whatever need it is we may have this morning. Whatever need that is needed of a family member or, or a friend or or some other situation, God, we ask you. To do a miracle, to do a restoration, to do reconciliation, to do whatever God is on our hearts this morning. We thank you that you are the God that we place our faith in. I pray you bless each one here today as we leave and that you would guide us through this week in whatever situations may come up. God, help us to always focus on you, to take the time to worship you, to praise you, and to listen to you. God, again, we pray for Knox and Kay as they travel. Keep them safe. We pray again for Michael LaDuke. God, that you would strengthen him, restore him this morning. We continue to pray for the continued progress of little Melanie and for Jesse and, and Sarah. And as they walk through this time, God, we thank you for what you're doing through it, even though we can't see it all right now, but you're at work. And we thank you for that. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.